Only igneous rocks can be used as reliable natural clocks as they have a known initial condition, all parent and no daughter. This is simply a fact of geology. When igneous rocks form, they are indeed all parent material. We also know that the rate of decay is constant, meeting the second criteria for a natural clock. Well, how do we know that it's constant? Because we've literally thrown everything and the kitchen sink at the process to try and speed it up. We've tried high and low temperatures and pressures, irradiation with x-rays and gamma rays, bombardment with high energy particles, various levels of magnetic and electric fields, and incredibly high accelerations of gravity. Conditions which would never be seen in nature on our planet. And the best we could do was acceleration by 1.5%, and even that was on a geologically irrelevant element. So the rate is, to our knowledge, constant. This is something that was admitted by the very creationists who were trying to prove that it wasn't. Decay also has a known final condition, that being all daughter material. And the process is indeed irreversible. Radiometric dating is also corroborated by a dozen or so independent methods as well, and the fossil fuel industry relies on its accuracy for finding said fossil fuels to the tune of around $250 billion annually. So this seems pretty solid. Kerogen. Under heat and pressure, kerogen gradually changes into oil or gas. The whole process usually takes at least a million years. At the molecular level, oil and gas are hydrocarbons made up of hydrogen and carbon atoms. The constant pressure and movement of the Earth's crust squeezes oil and gas through the pores or spaces within rocks. Some oil and gas reaches the Earth's surface and seeps out naturally into land or water. Often it is trapped beneath the surface by impermeable layers or rock structures, like faults and folds. Within the crust, oil or gas deposits build up and form reservoirs. Reservoirs are like vast sponges filled with oil and gas. They can be as large as a city. To find oil and gas deposits, geologists use a number of different survey techniques, including seismic surveys, gravitational surveys, and geological mapping. Seismic surveys use reflected sound waves to produce a 3D view of the Earth's interior. New technologies, such as four-dimensional projections and sophisticated graphic renderings of rock structures, are improving the way we find conventional oil and gas deposits. Energy resources that are currently difficult or expensive to extract are called unconventional oil and gas. Planet Earth. If you look closer, you'll see that a whole other world exists beneath the surface of land and sea. Layer after layer of rock structures go deep into the Earth's crust, mile after mile, and trapped within these structures, along with other liquids and solids, you'll often find deposits of oil and natural gas, the world's two most important sources of energy. These famous fuels are in constant demand because they make the world go round, day in and day out. So how do you find something that's completely hidden beneath the Earth's surface? It's a mystery that people in the oil and gas industry are always trying to solve, and for very good reason. Drilling for hydrocarbons is expensive. And before they spend money on equipment and crews, exploration and production companies need a reliable strategy for pinpointing where to drill. Geoscientists have a secret weapon called seismic exploration, and it involves sending acoustic energy, which takes the form of wavelets, into the ground to get a sound picture beneath the surface. It's complicated, so let's start with the analogy of bats. Bats can't see very well, so they send out little waves of sound that bounce off of objects and then go back to their ears. It's called sonar. It gives them what you might call a sound picture of their world. 
That's a good example of how nature already uses a form of seismic acoustic imaging to locate objects. Doctors also use it for ultrasound imaging. Geoscientists use man-made tools to make the sound wavelets, listen to them, and then record them. When you want to know if oil and gas deposits are in a particular area, geophysical companies bring large trucks that have big vibrators on them. Most of the time, this is what generates the acoustic energy or vibration. They use geophones or very sensitive seismic microphones to hear the reflected sounds, but sometimes they set off small buried charges. They set many geophones on the ground in a line and they are attached to a recorder inside another truck. The vibrators send thousands of wavelets down into all the different layers of the earth. Some of the wavelets bounce off of the boundaries between the rocks below the surface and are reflected back to the geophones that are waiting to record them. Each geophone along the cable sends the received wavelets to the recording truck where they're recorded and stored. Here's what seismic looks like after it's been recorded. Basically, it's a bunch of squiggles. There are still a few more steps to go before it begins to look like an actual picture of the Earth's interior. Right now, the data is still in its raw form. To get a picture that actually looks like the Earth beneath us, the data has to be processed. It takes a large supercomputing PC cluster to process the seismic data. These computers go through all the different traces made by the wavelets and filter out everything we don't need, such as vibrations made by a tractor in a field nearby. Using really amazing pewter applications and working on state-of-the-art workstations, geoscientists can see the seismic data translated into a 3D picture. You might be thinking, I don't see any oil and gas there. But believe it or not, geoscientists can look at this process data with their trained eyes and make an informed decision about whether or not oil and gas deposits are in the geologic structures. Seismic data leads to a high percentage of drilling success with less risk to the environment. And in a world where the demand for oil and gas is increasing faster than the supply, good seismic information will lead to more affordable energy. Density, basically you know how things, how heavy things are, okay? It's how much mass per unit volume you have. That's density. And obviously everybody knows about how dense metal is or how dense a rock is, but fluids and gas also have densities. And based on that density, they're drawn more towards the Earth by gravity. So gravity acts on that mass to pull it down towards the center of the Earth. And if we take a look at a bottle where we put in some water, some oil, and some gas, you'll notice that they always come in the same order. The water goes on the bottom, the oil goes in the middle, and the gas goes on top. And that's the order they will always occur. No matter what I do with this bottle, the order always remains the same. And the reason is, is that water is denser, oil is in the middle, and gas is the lightest of the three. And that's why they will always remain in that order. Now, if you think about what's in the ground, obviously the most abundant of these is going to be water. Water is everywhere. Okay, You dr dig a hole in your backyard, you'll hit water. Whereas oil and gas are a little bit harder to find. And those are the things that are going to be worth the most money. Now, the one thing I want you to notice when we look at something like this is that the oil and gas are always at the top. Okay, they always go to the top. So later on, you're going to learn how to drill for oil. And the one thing you've got to keep in mind is that they always go to the top. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is something called porosity and permeability. Well, porosity is basically open space in any material. And any material you can look at has some open space inside of it. Some have more and some have less. So for example, if you look at a sponge, there's a lot of air space in the sponge. That air space is the porosity. That air space can have water in it as well, but that's the porosity. It's not the sponge itself. It's an open hole. Swiss cheese has porosity. It's got those holes in it. So that's the porosity part. Now if you take that sponge and you squeeze it, all the water is going to come back out of the sponge. And that is the permeability. The ability to flow from one pore space to the next, that's the permeability. So if you have ever seen bubble wrap, for example. Bubble wrap, those were all little bubbles of plastic encasing air. Okay? Now, 
that means it's got porosity, because all that air space is porosity. But can the air flow from one bubble to the next? No. Not unless you pop it. Once you pop it, then, then it has some permeability. But until you do, it just has porosity and doesn't have permeability. Now, what we need, what we're looking for in rocks, is to have both porosity and permeability, or neither. Okay? Rocks can have, as I said, porosity and permeability. And here we have two different rock types. Okay? The first rock, the one on the right-hand side, is called sandstone, this tan one. Over here on the left-hand side is shale. The sandstone is kind of basically made up of sand grains that are stuck together. The shale is made out of clays that have all been sedimented down and hardened. Okay? So what we can do is we can decide which one of these has porosity and permeability. So if I take a little bit of water and I put it on the shale, the water just runs right off the shale. Okay? And therefore, it has no porosity or permeability. Now, if we take that, do that same test, and we put it on the sandstone, what we'll notice that'll happen is it will run a little bit, but this, all the water soaks up into the sandstone. Okay, so therefore, sandstone has high porosity and permeability, whereas shale has no porosity and permeability. Now, if we were going to take the oil and the gas and the water that we just looked at, and we were going to put them into one of these rocks, which rock would you pick? That's right, you would pick the sandstone. The sandstone can store oil, water, or gas inside of it. And therefore, it is what is called a reservoir rock. The word reservoir means to store. So we have store those things in here. Okay, And so that is where we would put all of our oil and gas if we were going to accumulate it. However, if we go back and look at this bottle that we just had, we will notice that the gas is held up at the top. Now, so what would, we, what would happen if we pulled the cap off of this bottle? Well, that's right. All the gas would escape into the atmosphere and wind up in the room rather than inside of this, this bottle. So therefore, the cap is what's holding it in. Okay? Now, the same thing happens with oil and gas accumulations. So we may be able to put all the oil and gas inside of this reservoir rock, the sandstone, but if we don't seal it in, it's going to all escape. So what we need is a cap rock, the shale. So the shale acts like a piece of saran wrap. Now, in order to drill wells, and you know, there's been a lot of things on television where you can see people drilling for wells, coming up with oil. For example, if you've ever watched the Beverly Hillbillies, they made a movie out of it, it used to be an old TV show. The guy goes in the backyard shooting at a rabbit, misses the rabbit, and all this oil comes squirting out of the ground. Okay, well, that's not quite the way it works anymore. And you could get some oil and gas coming to the ground. The La Brea tar pits are actually oil seeping to the surface. But in general, the shallowest you need to drill a well is about a mile down to get oil or gas. A mile. And so I don't think you can find too many shotguns that can reach a mile down into the earth. So you have to drill. And drilling's not an easy thing. It takes a lot of engineering. It takes a lot of time. You're drilling through rock. It costs a lot of money to be able to drill a well. So you kind of want to know where you're going before you start drilling. And the way you do that is a little technique called seismic reflection. Okay? Seismic reflection is something that's been around a long time, about six decades. But we actually use something like that now in, that you've seen. And so if a woman is going to have a baby and she wants to go to the doctor and to make sure the baby is safe and healthy and everything else, they do they perform on it what is called an ultrasound. Okay, and everybody's probably heard of that, produce a sonogram. And how that works is you put a device on the woman's stomach and it shoots out high frequency sound waves that penetrate through the skin, penetrate everything, hit the surface of the baby and bounce back up towards the, this, that device, which also has a receiver on it. Once the receiver gets the waves coming back off that have bounced off, it can then image what the baby looks like. Okay? And that's the way the ultrasound works. 
ultra high sound waves bouncing off of the baby coming back up to the surface. Well, they've been able to see what's underground doing that for many years now. Six decades they've been doing that in the oil business. It is basically generating a wave by some method. The wave hits the sur an interface between two different rock types, bounces back up to the surface. And you can image way down 10, 15 miles deep to see what the shape of the strata are underground, okay? And so that is how then we can kind of see what things look like underground before we drill a well to them. So maybe we can see what we might want to drill at rather than just drilling blindly. Okay, now we have a little device here that I put together so people can see what seismic reflection looks like. And what you can see here is, is a box and it is made out of plexiglass shell. Okay, so you can see all these, you see it's plexiglass on the top, but I'll tell you now that there's a bunch of shelves underneath there. And I can say to you, how many shelves are there? And you can say, you can take a guess, or maybe you, if you look on the side, you can see. But otherwise, how are we going to tell otherwise without pulling this apart to see how many shelves are, which is a pain in the neck. Pull it apart to put it back together again. What we can do is we can take a little laser pointer and we can just turn that on and you will see that all the dots come up on the back and you can count them and you can see there's four dots which means there are four shelves. Now what's happening is that the laser is hitting each one of those shelves reflecting off of there and the little dot is coming up to the surface. Okay, so with that, without even pulling it apart, I know how many shelves are there. Now if I'm careful to slide it across, I can even see what shape those shelves are. So you can see that the top three are pretty much flat. But look at what that bottom one is doing. That's tilted. So with this, I can see the shape of the shelves, and I can see how many there are. So this is giving me some idea of what's underground without having to actually dig a hole to it. So here are three things that we have put together then to help define our different types of oil accumulations. We're going to use all three of them now. We're going to put them together and we're going to find out what are called oil and gas traps. So here are three things that we have put together then to help define are different types of oil accumulations. We're going to use all three of them now. We're going to put them together and we're going to find out what are called oil and gas traps. Okay? So we're going to use the density, porosity and permeability, and seismic reflection all together to define oil and gas traps. Okay? These are pictures of oil and gas traps, okay? And we'll start off with, and that's what an accumulation is called, a trap, okay? And so what we'll start off with is what is called a stratigraphic trap. And this on this side is a stratigraphic trap. This is a block diagram. The green part is the surface of the earth. Everything else is looking down into the earth, okay? So these are cuts down into the earth. Now, if you look, you will see a wedge-shaped um, area on the first one, on this stratigraphic trap, and it is encased in brown. Okay, now the brown is cap rock, and the wedge shape area is reservoir rock. So in order to tell what shape it is underground from the surface without having to dig down there, and digging would be a very costly thing, we would use seismic reflection. So the seismic reflection will tell us that there is a wedge-shaped body underground. We know, so that's the first thing we're using. The next thing we're using is that we know that the brown is cap rock and the wedge-shaped body is reservoir rock. So that's the second stuff that we talked about. Now, if you look inside of there, you'll notice that it's white on top, black in the middle, and gray on the bottom. White is gas, black is oil, and gray is water. So it's in the same order that we talked about for our density. So all three are applied to this feature. Okay, so that's the first one. Second one, we can over and look at this, which is called an anticline trap. Now, when two continents smash into each other, or a lot of other ways too, rocks can actually be folded. 
Okay, and they can fold down into a U shape or they can fold up into an arch shape. And an arch shape fold is what is called an anticline trap. Okay, and so this is a picture of an anticline trap. You can see again, surface is green, and we can see underground the, the brown is the cap rock, the one underneath the cap rock is our reservoir rock, and once again we can see gas, oil, water in the same order. So therefore we can see that both of these are taking all three of our concepts and putting them together to make oil and gas traps. Okay, and if we look at both of these and kind of stand back and look at them, we will see that the oil and gas in both examples sits right at the top of the structure. So as I said, always drill high, always drill at the highest point, and you can see clearly that that's exactly where you need to go on any feature that's geological. Okay, we have a couple other um, types of traps here. Down on the bottom is what is called a fault trap. Okay, in a fault, not only does it produce earthquakes, but it can also offset layers. So you can have a continuous layer of reservoir rock that then is cut by the fault and then placed up against, shoved up against cap rock. And that will encase it in cap rock and allow you to accumulate gas on the top, oil in the middle, water on the bottom. Okay, so that's another type. Last type is what is called a salt dome trap. Now in some areas of the world where we have very high evaporation, hot temperatures, where a little sea might be cut off from the main ocean, you can get conditions of what are called hypersalinity. You get huge amounts of salt accumulating in these things, and the salt can actually deposit on the floor of the ocean. So you get salt depositing, it can be quite thick, on the floor of the ocean. Now, later on, once you add clay and sand on top of the salt, the salt then turns very squishy, and it kind of looks like, acts like toothpaste, and it's very light, and so you squish it down with that sand and clay, and it can squirt back up to the surface in what is called a salt diapir or a salt dome. Okay, and these salt diapirs or salt domes are where we get our table salt from or even our road salt. They mine these. Okay? But the other thing they do is if you have layers of trap rock and, or cap rock on top of reservoir rock, they can bend everything up and you can get big accumulations of oil and gas around them. And if you get these big accumulations, these can be worth a lot of money. We get most of our oil and gas in the United States from the Gulf of Mexico. And in the Gulf of Mexico, the big plays are these salt domes. A single salt dome can have two and a half to three billion barrels of oil. Last year, oil was selling for $100 a barrel. So that's $300 billion a single salt dome can be worth. That's more than most companies in the United States, okay? More than a lot of countries. So that's how much things are worth if you can find the right trap and drill it. Okay? So that is the background material then for this oil game. Okay? And this is the oil game.
October 22, 2015 marks World Energy Day, when we observe the need to take environmental action in the face of energy dependence. This holiday originated at the 2012 World Energy Forum, intended to address the future of oil and sustainability. Although peak oil usage was supposed to have occurred in the 1970s, today production and use is as high as ever. So we wanted to know, just how much oil do we actually have left? Well, unlike more modern forms of energy, crude oil is a non-renewable resource, meaning that once we use it all up, it's gone. Almost all of the world's oil is located in vast reservoirs, centralized in a number of countries. However, whether that oil can actually be extracted is referred to as proven or unproven. Proven reserves simply means that there is a 90% chance of the oil being extracted, and we know it's there. Unproven generally means that we believe it's there, but for a number of reasons can't extract it with certainty. Generally, oil estimates focus on proven reserves. So how much oil is still left? Well, as of 2014, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries reports that roughly 1.5 trillion barrels of proven reserves are still available. For comparison, some have estimated that 1 trillion barrels have been used since commercial oil drilling began in 1870, although other estimates vary wildly. And while a century and a half seems like a pretty long time, oil use has been rapidly increasing. Today, the world consumes about 34 billion barrels a year, with China expected to account for half that usage within the next five years. But China only holds about 32 billion barrels itself. Roughly 80% of the world's oil comes from the 12 members of OPEC, with roughly two-thirds of the oil located in the Middle East. However, the single largest reserve on the Earth is nowhere near most of the other OPEC countries. 20% of the world's oil is located in Venezuela, South America. They reportedly hold almost 300 billion barrels. Saudi Arabia comes in close with about 265 billion barrels. The third highest reserves, though, are found in Canada, which is a non-OPEC nation. In fact, of the 285 billion barrels held outside of OPEC countries, more than 60% is in Canada. But how long all that oil will last us is a somewhat shaky subject. Some say that we'll soon end up relying on unconventional oil extraction, like fracking, to power the world. Others say we'll make a shift to alternative energies, like solar or wind, before it's too late. But the most recent estimates by British Petroleum say that we have a little over 50 years before the oil runs out. Still, almost every figure, including the amount of oil reserves, consumption rate, and number of years left, has been widely disputed, and past estimates are repeatedly revised. So how much oil do we really have left? It seems like nobody really knows.